In this narrated PowerPoint, we'll be talking about geologic time. The Earth is over 4 billion years old, and the oldest rock is dated about 3.8 billion years. And across this time expanse, the Earth's surface has undergone tectonic changes, pun intended. But for this class, we are interested only in a small slab of time, basically 10,000 years over which major events occurred that shaped the Pacific Northwest landscape. In particular, we are interested in the last 300 years, the time since the last, last major subductions on earthquake shook the Pacific Northwest, dropping coastal areas below sea levels, inundating coastal forests, and sending a massive tsunami racing across the Pacific, wrecking havoc along the Japanese coast. The concept of geologic time has concerned thinkers across human history. During his life, Aristotle concluded that fossils re represent the remains of ancient life, an idea supported over 1,700 years later by the brilliant and talented, talented polymath Leonardo da Vinci. Outside of Europe, the Persian 11th century geologist Avicenna concluded that in layered sedimentary rocks, the oldest rocks lie below the younger rocks. This idea was a precursor to the law of superposition developed and articulated in the 1800s. Here are a few more players in the geologic age game. Bishop Usher, an Irish bishop, completed a careful analysis of biblical text in order to determine the age of the earth. His diligent and precise work placed the beginning of geologic time at Sunday, October 23, 4004 BC, making the earth approximately 6,000 years old. James Hutton, a Scottish geologist, and other geologists disputed this work and instead concluded that the Earth was not thousands, but millions of years old. Part of Hutton's work involved using the thickness of sedimentary rocks, coupled with estimates of the rate at which sediment accumulates, to calculate an approximate age of the Earth. This work resulted in ages in the millions of years, which is still a bit short of the now currently billions of years old that we know the Earth to be. A notable entry into the age of the Earth discussion was the physicist Lord Kelvin, the former William Thompson. Lord Kelvin was a prominent physicist and engineer and had significant influence over scientific matters, and there, therefore when he spoke, or wrote, people listened. He used the cooling of the Earth via conduction as a framework from which to calculate the time it would take for a fully molten Earth to cool to the present solid state. His calculations indicated an age between 20 and 40 million years old for the Earth. This was still a far cry from the currently accepted 4 billion year age. The advent of modern ideas for the age of the Earth developed with the discovery of radioactivity and the utilization of radioactive decay and minerals to determine the age of rocks. There are many players during this part of the game. Notable among them was Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealander who in the early 1900s discovered the concept of half-life. The concept of half-life is the foundation for modern geochronology, that is, the geologic discipline concerned with determining the age of geologic features and processes. A discussion on the principles of dating rocks is beyond the scope of this presentation and this class. Suffice it to say that the half-life of radioactive elements that are contained within minerals is the clock that geologists can use to find the age of the rocks. By measuring the products of radioactive decay, knowing the half-life of the element, one can back calculate the age of the mineral. For more information on this, please refer to the links in the week three folder. Up to this time, we have been concerned with determining a number, that is the age or age of the Earth or some geologic process or phenomena. This number represents the absolute age of the feature or process. Your age in years is an absolute age. You know your birth year so you can calculate your absolute age. A second way to think about geologic time is to consider the relative age of the feature. This is essentially placing events in order based on observation and some common fundamental principles. The human analogy for relative age would be comparing your age to, say, your younger brother. You are older than him. 
Early efforts at reckoning the age of the Earth relied heavily on relative age dating. Many of the conclusions of this work, which seem rudimentary, is still very valid and important. To get the relative age of geologic features, we use common sense principles to develop logical arguments for which feature is younger or older. In the photo of the Grand Canyon, we use the principle of superposition to infer that the oldest rocks are at the bottom of the layered sedimentary rocks and the younger rocks are near the top of the stack, much like a layer cake. This is the same principle that Avicenna used back in the 11th century. In the image to the right, we use the principle of cross-cutting relations to determine that the fault that cuts and has moved the rock layers, note the change in location of the volcanic layers, is younger than the rock layers. This just makes sense. In the layer cake analogy, you cut the cake after you have constructed the layers and cooked them. Therefore, you know that the cut is later than the layers of the cake. Another principle, and there are more, we will cover is the principle of final succession. One of the tasks for a geologist is to correlate rocks and events that formed or occurred in one area to another location. Sometimes these two are quite geographically removed from each other, like across the Atlantic Ocean. The presence of similar fossils in different rock layers was used to infer that the rock layers were the same age. Later work using radiometric dating and additional fieldwork confirmed many of these early inferences. Please do note that this is a very preliminary study of the discipline of geochronology. There are more concepts, principles, and techniques that are used to study the age of geologic features and processes. But let's stop here and check in. The diagram above is a schematic of five geologic features that we can determine the relative age. A through C are sedimentary rock layers. D is an igneous feature called a dike. And E is a fault. Can you place these in geochronological order? That is, can you determine the relative age of these five features? This is a very authentic problem, despite the cartoon nature of the diagram. So turn off the video, make your inferences, and then turn it back on to check your answer. The correct relative sequence is, from oldest to youngest, C, B, A, D, E. So C is the oldest because it's at the bottom of the layered sequence. We use the law of superposition for this inference. C is followed by B and then A. After formation of A, the whole sequence was cut by the igneous dike D, which was then cut by the fault E. We use the law of cross-cutting relations to make this inference. How'd you do? Understanding this concept will be vital in our work when, with the mystery of the 1700 earthquake that struck the Pacific Northwest. This image shows a representation of ge geologic time outlining the eras, periods, and epochs. The foundation for geologic time, referred to as deep time, was built upon relative and absolute age dating and is a very robust reckoning of the age of the Earth. Fortunately for our purposes, we are really not that interested in most of this time scale. Phew, that's a relief. Instead, we are mainly interested in the final era, the Cenozoic. And within the Cenozoic, we are mainly interested in the tertiary and quaternary periods. And then down to the final epochs, the Pleistocene and Holocene epochs that cover the last 1.6 million years of geologic time. And if we go a little smaller in time, earthquake studies, called paleoseismic studies, are mainly concerned with the last 100,000 years. And of this 100,000 years, it is the last 10,000 that is of the highest interest. During class, we have already discussed some time scale and rates of geologic processes. Now we will put these in the framework of the concepts just covered. This image shows a familiar, familiar geography. 
You should be familiar with these features and will be asked to display some facility with naming major ge geographic and geologic features of the Pacific Northwest. Relative to this discussion, rates of plate motion are measured on a scale of kilometers per million years, which are frequently reported as millimeter or centimeter per year. Rates of plate motion are commonly correlated with fingernail growth. That is, over time, plates move at the same rate as the growth of fingernails. For the Juan de Fuca plate, the motion, as measured by a variety of means, including GPS, is around 40 mil millimeters per year. You should remember this number. This means that in 10 years, the Juan de Fuca plate will move about 40 centimeters, around 15 inches. Now, where this movement is absorbed is another question. Is the movement smooth with the plate subducting aseismically, that is, without producing an earthquake and releasing seismic energy? Is some of the movement transferred to the warping of both the ocean and continental lithosphere? How about the transform boundaries? Some of the movement could be along these. These are questions that are still being investigated. There are two types of earthquake time. Co-seismic, which is the time during earthquakes, and interseismic, which is the time between earthquakes. Co-seismic time occurs on the scales of minutes to seconds. That is the duration of many earthquakes. Interseismic time operates on the scale of tens to thousands of years. This means that some faults along plate boundaries can be quiet for a long time prior to rupturing and producing another earthquake. That is the danger here in the Pacific Northwest. The Cascadia subduction zone has not had significant movement in over 300 years, during which a huge segment moved, releasing massive amounts of energy during that earthquake. So let's use the concept of co-seismic and interseismic to make some rough estimates of the recurrence time for the Cascadia subduction zone. You should be able to complete these types of calculations on the test. The last co-seismic event was January 26th, 1700, which is a pretty robust estimate. That is, we know this date pretty accurately. So, if it has been about 300 years of interseismic time, to calculate the recurrence, we take the plate motion rate of 40, 40 millimeters per year. We use a value of 20 meters of slip per event which is an average for many subduction zone events. And then we ask, how many years would it take to move 20 meters? We divide the amount of slip by the plate motion rate to get 500 years. This value is the recurrence rate for this subduction zone. Now this is a pretty rough estimate, and other work suggests that the number may be closer to 300 years. This means that the probability of a major Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is fairly high. Some estimates as high as a 30% probability within the next decade. This final slide lists the time since major geologic events, mostly earthquakes with one volcanic eruption and one large flood, the Missoula floods that happened 10 to 14,000 years ago. Why are we looking at these? One reason is to illustrate the short memory that we have for catastrophic events, which makes it more difficult to develop an awareness mentality among the general public. You know, out of sight, out of mind. This lack of awareness and action can be pervasive in an area that has not suffered a major event in 300 years, which was prior to written records. But geologic data are pretty solid for the potential of a large earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. It happened before, and can it happen again?